Hey, welcome back. Um, we are starting a new topic, the French Revolution. It uh, directly ties into everything we've been talking about before. It's specifically the Enlightenment, the American Revolution, and the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. So, before we do anything, you need to get out this uh, graphic organizer note-taking sheet. And then we'll do a little background on what France looked like in the 1700s. And when you are done... Uh, unpause the video and we'll get started with the uh, Prezi. So, French Revolution um, starts because of the way France was structured. The country was broken into three separate parts. So you belonged in either what was called the first estate, second estate, or the third estate. And on your hierarchy chart, you got a triangle where there's a place to fill in these three different areas. So the first estate, let's talk about them. To be in the first estate, you had to be a member of the clergy. Clergy are people who work for the church. So that would be bishops and priests. And it also would include the pope. Um, that's a very small percentage of the population. One percent, if you look at the numbers. And they are going to actually own 10% of the land. So, um, as you can imagine, people are not excited about these guys up in front of the church telling you how you need to give to the poor, but then they are actually rich. Um, the other thing is, the first estate doesn't pay any taxes. So they are wealthy, but they don't have to pay any taxes. Um, now, <laughs> we'll get back to them in a minute. The second estate is the nobles. So all of the um, people who traditionally have been the rich people in Europe, the knights, the ones that live in the castles and the big palaces, um, those are the nobles. To be a noble, you have to inherit land. The other way in France you can move into the second estate is if you got a job a high-ranking job in the court system, or the government, or the military. So, there's twice as many nobles as clergy, and this is actually even more lopsided. They own a little over a third of the land. So, they're actually richer than the clergy, but they do pay some taxes, and we'll look at that in a second. Um, a lot of the people in the clergy came from the nobility. So the people in charge of the church are nobles. So all the bishops, in order to be a bishop, you actually had to come from a noble family in France. The third group of people, and this is where almost everyone lived, was the third estate. So in the third estate, we have kind of three different groups here. The biggest group is going to be the peasants. So 80% of the third estate most of the people, four out of every five people in the third estate are peasants. And they, even though 80% of them are peasants, only 40% of those people own land. And half of them, sorry, they only owned 40% of the land that the third estate had. Half of the people in the third estate don't own any land. So they are just um, struggling to survive. The other group you have are the bourgeois, they're the middle class, and then the city workers, so people who have good paying jobs, but they're not really wealthy. But they do have a nice job, and they're not going to be nobles. So this is 97% of France belongs in this group. It's basically everybody who's not a noble or clergy, and they only own a little over half the land. So they are almost the whole population, they only own part of the land, but in the government when they vote, each estate gets one vote. So these two groups are basically the same people, so they always are going to vote together, and so these people, who are 97% of the population, almost always get outvoted in the government. And eventually that's going to lead to frustration that they are not being um, represented by their government. So let's look at this for a second. Pause the video and let's look at this closely. 
So this chart is actually the one that would sh probably shows the best how people, what leads to people's eventual frustration in the revolution. You have the third estate that's paying half of the taxes in the whole country. Or sorry, half of their, half of the money they make is paid in taxes. Um, but these other people are paying pretty much no tax. So, <clears throat> what happens is the third estate is going to end up being poor while these two are actually getting richer. So you can imagine that the people doing all the work are going to get frustrated if they feel like they're doing all the work and they're getting poorer and the people they work for don't work as hard and are getting richer. Which is going to lead to the revolution. So let's look at the big causes of the revolution. We've got the third estate. They are paying half of what they make in taxes. They're paying almost half of what they make to pay for their food, which leaves them virtually nothing else. Um, a lot of them don't have enough money to buy shoes because they're spending so much money on food and taxes. Um, for most of the peasants, that's all they can afford is food and taxes. They don't have enough money for anything else. <clears throat> the next thing that's going to make this worse is they see the king is still living in Versailles, that big enormous palace Louis XIV built. And meanwhile, they are just trying to not starve to death and stay alive. And he's living in the most fabulous building on the planet. And all of that is going to be made worse <clears throat> when the weather gets bad and the harvests uh, are going to fail for a few years in a row, actually. And so that is going to make it harder to make bread. The price of bread um, is going to go up really fast, but the amount of money the people are paying is not going to go up. And the reason this is a big deal is because three-fourths of their food came was bread. That was three-quarters of their diet, is they ate bread. So if they cannot afford bread, they are going to end up starving. And when you have starving people, they get frustrated and they get angry. Now, a second um, element to this is the king at this time is not going to be a super powerful leader. His name is Louis XVI. We already know France is involved in a whole lot of wars. They're super expensive. People feel like this guy is not a decisive leader, so they lose confidence in him because they feel like he <clears throat> is not somebody who can take charge. And what he's going to do that is not unreasonable is they need money. He's got this group of people who don't pay taxes. He's going to try and tax them. Um, and they're going to get upset because people do not like having taxes put on them. And in this situation, these guys actually have more power than him. So it's going to cause him a problem. They're going, to, they're going to resist. Now, on top of that, he is married to this Austrian lady. The French do not trust or like the Austrians. She's, um, she is a little bit over the top. She's all these stereotypes that you have of rich people. She's always trying to influence his political decisions, and she is spending more money <clears throat> than um, most people can even conceive on things like clothes and hairdo and outfits. So it's all things she doesn't need. Um, it would be like somebody spending a year's salary on a dress they're going to wear for one night. That's the kind of money she is using up, and it's going to lead to extreme frustration with the poorer people. The third cause, which we've talked about a ton, is the Enlightenment. All these ideas are going to leak out. I'd like you to pause the video and answer this question, because we've spent a lot of time on the Enlightenment. I want you to think about all these ideas we've talked about. How would they, mixed in with all this other stuff, lead to the revolution? And the fourth thing, 
which we alluded to a little bit. Pause it again. You know what happened in the American Revolution. How is that going to contribute to when you add it with these other three things to a revolution in France? So pause the video, answer that, unpause it when you're ready to move on. And we get to the big stuff. So in the section it says the early events of the French Revolution, you should be uh, filling in this stuff about the Estates General. So Estates General is their government, it's like their parliament in France. <clears throat> so first thing that happens, the, they're going to show up to this parliament meeting, the Estates General. The third estate is going to say, we think from now on, we should vote on the number of rep the number of representatives who vote. Everybody everybody counts. So each person in the building gets a vote. The majority rules. First estate and the second estate say, no, no, no. We should do it like we've always done, where each estate gets one vote, and that way we always win. So the third estate is eventually going to get frustrated with this, and they actually are going to form their own government. They're going to say, that's fine. We are no longer part of the Estates General. We're forming our own government of France called the National Assembly. It's just like what happens in the United States when the colonists decide, you know what, we're going to form our own government. We don't need your government. Um, and they're actually going to be locked out. Once they um, say that, once they threaten this, they're not going to be let back into the government buildings. So they are going to meet outside. It's actually a racquetball court, but the event is called the Tennis Court Oath. Those members of the Third Estate are going to meet. They're going to take an oath or a promise that they will not leave where they are until they've actually come up with a new constitution for France. It's just like the Constitutional Convention in the U.S., really, where they all agree, we're going to meet here. It's technically illegal. We know it's illegal, but whatever we're going to form a new government. And that is going to actually inspire the start of the revolution. So what we have, and you're going to see this in big detail, the actual start of the revolution where there is shooting and um, we see the National Assembly start to take over is called the storming of the Bastille. So there is a prison in Paris called the Bastille or the Bastille in French. And the, these revolutionaries are going to storm this. Their goal is they're going to free pl political prisoners. And we're going to get into detail there. But the important thing is it becomes extremely violent. This is going to be the hallmark of the revolution. This is what is considered their Independence Day, July 14th in 1789. It's the start of the actual revolution. And now, tying it all back into the Enlightenment and the American Revolution, they are actually going to write something called the Declaration of the Rights of Man. It's like their Declaration of Independence. And this is interesting. This is almost, word for word, a French translation of George Mason's document, the Declaration of Rights that um, he wrote for Virginia about 10 years earlier in our revolution. Um, and the big ideas come from which Enlightenment thinker? Liberty, property, and fraternity. Whose ideas are those based on? Um, and they're going to form a democratic government. They're not getting rid of the king. It's just like in England. They're going to keep the king but he's going to have fewer powers, and they say he's got to depend on um, the National Assembly or the Parliament. He can't rule by himself. So that's a really quick uh, summary of the early parts. We will be looking at all that stuff in detail in class over the next few um, days. If you have any questions, please let me know.